Hello and welcome back to A House Divided, coming to you live from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. If it's on our shelves, it's history. My name is Bjorn Skaptesen, and I am your host for today's episode of Take a Break with of Take a Break with History of A House Divided. Uh, we were just with each other last week, and what we talked about last week was a biography of a Confederate general. And so I figured we couldn't get enough of that. Uh, so we're going to talk about another Confederate general today. Last week, we talked with Elizabeth Varon about uh, Longstreet. There's a book board for Longstreet. Today, we are welcoming back to A House Divided, Dr. Timothy B. Smith. And he is going to be talking about a couple of books, two books today, two for one today, two books. One is The Iron Dice of Battle, Albert Sidney Johnson and the Civil War in the West. And the other one is Bayou Battles for Vicksburg, which is the fourth of five volumes that Tim is bringing us about a military history of the Vicksburg campaign. Now, we are on a time clock today. We are on a time clock today. So I want to get this, this program started right away. Now, about the program itself. This is a book signing party. You can buy the book. It's not just an interview about uh, Albert Sidney Johnson and Vicksburg. It's a book signing party. Today is the release date for Iron Dice of Battle. Brand new book, just hitting the bookshelves. If you want to buy it, there will be a link in the comments. You can put all your information in there. And we will send you a signed first edition copy of either one of these books, or preferably both of these books. And then finally, let me introduce our guest for today. Dr. Timothy B. Smith teaches history at the University of Tennessee at Martin. And his books include a bunch of Vicksburg books. We're probably going to talk about the Vicksburg books during the course of this program. Uh, but he has also brought us... Uh, Shiloh, Conquer or Perish, The Real Horse Soldiers, The Mississippi Secession Convention, the, This Great Battlefield of Shiloh, Corinth, 1862, Grant Invades Tennessee, and that's not even half of the books that Tim Smith has written for us. So thank you for writing those books, Tim, and thank you for joining us on A House Divided. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sure, sure. And... Uh, Gosh, where do I start today? I guess what I want to start today is let's divide up the conversation between the books so that people don't get confused. Uh, so let's start with the Iron Dice of Battle, because today is the release date, the publication date of the, of the Iron Dice of Battle. Uh, Albert Sidney Johnston and the Civil War in the West comes to us from LSU Press, and we thank them very much for publishing the book. Has 222 pages, maps, illustrations, dust jackets, the whole bit. $39.95, you can order it at the link in the comments. It is, I think, a biography of Albert Sidney Johnston. Now, I've been told we've done a lot of biographies this fall. And within the last year, we've had Ben Butler, we've had Longstreet, we've had uh, On Great Fields, the Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And I've been told... Mm, by some people, well, it's got to be a full life to be a biography. And isn't isn't Iron Dice of Battle more of a military analysis? Well, I opened up the book, Tim, and right there on the first page, Albert Sidney Johnson gets born in 1803. <laughs> yeah. And then the book goes on like that until April 6, 1862, when he exits the scene. <laughs> Seems like a biography to me. Sounds like it, yeah. <laughs> So hey, give us a give us a short intro to Iron Dice of Battle. Uh, what were you trying to get to about the life of Albert Sidney Johnston with this book? Well, the main thing I wanted to do was to look at Johnston's Confederate career. Um, I didn't see any real need to redo his first what fifty eight years or so mm -hmm. of his life. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Charlie Rowland has done a wonderful biography, Albert Sidney Johnson, Soldier of Three Republics. And um, really, I, I have nothing to quibble with at all with the, the biography up through, you know, the first 200 pages or whatever, the, the majority of his life. It very, very well done. The Civil War parts are too. Um, 
but I, you know, that, that biography was done 60, 70, whatever years ago. Um, and interestingly, uh, Professor Rowland didn't have the three major studies of Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. They all were published later. Uh, he did not have the five major studies of Shallow. They were all published later. And so uh, I don't think the hashing out Johnston's Civil War career uh, was quite fully done. It was done very well at the time, but it was we have a lot more information to work on now. So I wanted to reanalyze a little bit, uh, primarily his um, his Civil War career, uh, and didn't want to reinvent the wheel and do a, a full, you know, four or five hundred page page biography. Now there are a couple we do get him born, you know, at the at the beginning he discovers America and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> but. Um, I, I did want to provide a couple of, of groundwork chapters for a couple of different reasons. Number one, maybe somebody hasn't read um, R Professor Rowland's biography uh, or his son, William Preston Johnson's biography. And so I didn't want to just start cold turkey at the beginning of the war because people would miss, you know, the, the earlier parts of life. So I wanted to give a short synopsis of that. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to do was to provide or maybe better way of saying it is to key in on certain aspects uh, of Johnston's earlier life to emphasize those that would become important um, in his in his Civil War career. So I wanted to 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 give both a, a fairly quick overview of his life prior to the Civil War, uh, and in that overview to key in on certain aspects that I will go back to. Uh, in his Confederate command, because we all learn things from from earlier in life, uh, we learn lessons. We we put uh, traits, uh, you know, in in uh, um, that we we've, we've learned over the course of our lives in into effect, you know, in in later life. So uh, there are things like that 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 were connecting points that I wanted to deal with as well. So some mm -hmm. have called it a biography, and I'm fine with that. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not set up definitely to not. I did not set out to. To replace Professor Rowland's biography, I still think it's one of the, the best biographies of a Civil War general out there. Um, but I wanted to to augment it and add to it, much like we, when we talk about Vicksburg, the same thing with Ed Barr's trilogy. I yeah. in no way wanted to replace it, uh, but build on it, add to it. Right, and uh, I'm I'm glad you brought up a little bit of the historiography because uh, uh, the Albert City Johnson Soldier of Three Republics, I think, is the correct title is yeah. one of the great civil war biographies but i want everybody to buy this one today uh, <laughs> yes. iron dice of battle so i was thinking about how to discuss it the other day looking at my bookshelf over here and this fun really charming little memoir jumped out at me oh i don't have my odyssey on through history Let me look. oh yeah yeah my odyssey through cool. history by uh uh, Dr. Charles P. Rowland, and um, and it, it just reminded me that uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Rowland was such a fine biographer and such a fine teacher of history, and I had a chance to meet him at least once on the Shiloh battlefield when, when he was doing there, and he really was one of the great experts about Shiloh. He grew up in the neighborhood and wrote this terrific, uh, full, fulsome life of Johnston. So I think what it was needed is what you decided to do. Let's take off the most crucial part of his life, the part that he wouldn't be famous for if he hadn't done it. And that is the Confederate command uh, in um, the last year of his life, the Confederate command. But there is something I want to touch on uh, before we bring him to the Civil War because I did really appreciate some of the stuff he wrote in those build-up chapters, there are some psychological and social characteristics of Johnston that affected his Civil War command. And so I think you very rightly bring some of that stuff, psychological and social stuff, into this book, provided it is the stuff that points to the decisions he made in uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. So Tell us some about that early life stuff. Not so much. I don't need the events. I want the stuff that goes that he learned. The stuff that goes on in right. his mind. Yeah. Well, you you see, uh, after the first thirty years of his life, it's almost a I would say a perfect life for the first thirty years. 
but then in the span of a couple of years, everything just goes sideways. He loses just tons of people close to him, uh, including his father, his uh, one of his children, his best friend from West Point, um, his job, and his wife. Um, and he is absolutely adrift. Uh, and he starts to, to, I think, overcompensate in what I call gamble um, to kind of reestablish himself and to reestablish his equilibrium. And he, he does this by making larger than life gambles, I think, uh, probably bigger than, than what he should have done. The whole thing of going out to Texas, you know, was questionable. Certainly fighting a duel over the command of the Texas Army was questionable. It nearly, nearly killed him. Um, buying that plantation at China Grove uh, that he never really could get out from under financially. Uh, there are a series of large earth life-shaking gambles that he takes um, to, to try to, to, try to uh, reassert himself, to, to make himself prominent again. Um, and you see that over and over as you go into his Confederate command because he's, he's facing the same exact situation of just almost almost uh, no way to get out of these situations. They're, they're hopeless almost situations um, when he commands the Western Department with so few troops and so much territory to defend. Um, and so he has to, to gamble, to roll those iron dice of battle, as he says, where the, 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 the title comes from. Um, and he has to bluff, you know, like a gambler would. And I, I look at a lot of it at his personality. And, you know, Johnson always kind of fancied himself as a chess player. He, he thought himself a, a cerebral, slow, methodical thinking chess player. But he was continually thrust into a fast paced, high stakes poker game. And, you know, poker is very different than chess, of course. Um, so he had a hard time putting those two together uh you know and um he couldn't always keep up uh he was too methodical to to keep up in the fast-paced movements of military uh gambles like that uh he was just absolutely too lenient with his subordinates uh he never could he had a very tame um meek personality and he never could bring himself to command people who were either his former equals or former superiors Mm -hmm. um, just for instance, and I, I, I assume this is what you're talking about kind of stuff is not lead me in a, in yeah. A oh direction. yeah, absolutely. I, the, um, no, I think, I think the uh, comparison between a chess player and a poker player, which you have in the book, uh, is apt and it comes up again and again and again right. in the, yeah. in his actions. Yeah. But uh, like his, his leniency with, with his subordinates, uh, Polk at, at Columbus, he never could really control him but he had been his, his roommate at West Point. Uh, John Floyd at, at Fort Donelson, uh, he couldn't control him, but he had been Secretary of War while Johnston was just a colonel. Uh, Gideon Pilla had been a division commander in Mexico while Johnston was just a, a Texas colonel. Uh, Beauregard had been the hero of Fort Sumter, the hero of Manassas, and he never could quite bring himself to control Beauregard. Uh, so these people that were, were equals at one point or superiors to him, uh, he had a hard time later on asserting his will. So he was very lenient, very methodical. Um, and just in my opinion, I went into this, I, I was fearful that there might be a little bit of hero worship. I, I never, in time, I've only done two biographies if this is a biography mm -hmm. um and i never want to be uh, you know uh, i don't want there to be claims of hero worship or or something like that um as it turns out there there wasn't any chance of that i i have always just had a I, i've always liked johnston you know mm -hmm. uh, just been not in all of him but i've always liked johnston uh but I, he just as I researched him, he just doesn't turn out to be a very good general. And the comparison, of course, a lot of people will say, well, if he had lived, uh, he would have learned from his mistakes like Lee did, and, and he would have become the Western Lee and all that. I just don't see a lifetime of these personal traits changing uh, in the last six months of his life. You know, Right. So. And I think we can, while well, we've had the entire first 59 years of his life or whatever, uh, uh, bring us up to here. And then the year in Kentucky, I think maybe people just need to buy the book and read it to get to that because that all of these, because all of these things that you're talking about, um, 
come up, they all boil down to the decisions that he makes in uh, one day or perhaps a series of two or three days. And they all build up to the decisions that happen once he arrives in Corinth and decides to go to uh, to Shiloh, and to Pittsburgh Landing, to try to destroy the Grant's army there. And so I want to I want to get to that because I know that's really the 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 key to this story. It's the reason you wrote the book. Right. And but I but to start on the Shiloh topic, one of the things that strikes me about Johnston at Shiloh is that the way he behaves, not necessarily the way he commands or thinks, the way he behaves is extraordinarily inspiring. He's a really easy guy to root for. And so it's it, I I feel like when I'm listening to the story of Albert Sidney Johnston at Shiloh or telling it to somebody, it it, it feels like he's a real protagonist in a story. You kind of want him to win because he's so inspiring. And therefore you don't, it's very easy to miss the point that he's making bad decisions. Right. Yeah. Well, he's the guy in the white hat. He's, he's, mm -hmm. he's humble. He's meek. Um, you know, wouldn't hurt a flea kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And he's an easy guy to, to root for, especially when you know his background, when he's had so many, um, you know, really, really significant bad things to, to happen. Um, he's just a guy that, that you would, you would want to be buddies with kind of, you know, mm -hmm. so you root for him. Uh, but the decisions that he makes um, based on that personality, that accumulated personality uh, throughout his life, just um, don't help the situation. To, and, and now, there are mitigating factors, obviously, of Johnson's command. He's put in an almost no-win situation that I'm not sure even Robert E. Lee could have pulled a rabbit mm -hmm. out of the hat on this one. But um, certainly Johnson's decision-making process doesn't, doesn't help the situation. Yeah. And who wants to, and nobody wants Beauregard to be right. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's not likable, uh, but the, but yeah, let, let's, let's just pick two or three decisions for the next 10 minutes or so sure. that we can unpack and see how, how his, uh, 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 how either his past or his training or his decision-making that's sort of, that it's sort of born into him or trained into him does not serve him right at Shiloh. We could start with why launch the attack from Corinth at that time in the first place. Right. Well, the, it is definitely a gamble. It is mm -hmm. absolutely a gamble. And so in this construct of gambling, uh, you know, versus chess and all that, I don't fault him for making that, that decision to, to attack. I really think it's the only decision they had, um, unless you just want to drag it out and, have a slow death kind of thing to the confederacy to 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 come close to anywhere winning this thing they have to counterattack there because they know the, the simple math two armies are are combining and you want to fight one at a time mm -hmm. um so i talk a little bit about you know and i mentioned the the whole chester nimitz thing the calculated risk um there's there's a fine line between going overboard gambling everything you know throwing in everything you got in in one hand um, and making calculated gambles when they are, are necessary. Um, and so as far as that goes, that's a necessary gamble um, as far as, as I'm concerned. I don't really see a whole lot of, of other choice that he or Borgard or any of them, of them had. And, and, you know, by the way, there's no real opposition anywhere to, to launching the attack at this point. Everybody mm -hmm. across the board, from Johnson Borgard to Corps Commander Jefferson Davis, everybody, is is on the same page that we we have to do this now you get into the nuances later decisions i don't know if you have specific ones in in well, mind you go to the mind. yeah we um, could go to the bivouac moment with you know beauregard wants to go back because they've wasted two days exactly if there is an inkling of johnston changing his personality and um the way he deals with the subordinates beauregard in this in this case uh, there's a, there's a glimmer there that tells me maybe he's changing a little bit, or maybe he's just so sick of Beauregard that he's, he's not listening to me. Well, I don't, I don't know which it is, but, um, you know, Professor Rowland called this jo Johnson's Clausewitzian moment. He, he okay. says it on the, Clausewitz talks about on the eve of every great battle, there's a, uh, there's a time where you have to just 
buck up your backbone and say, yes, we're doing this because it'll be so easy to to um, to to turn and get out of here and and lose, you know, uh, lose your determination. But every commander has to have it's like Eisenhower at D-Day, you know, the you know, the the weather reports were bad. And what do I do? And no, we're doing this. Um, so Johnston has kind of that that moment where he says, sorry, Pierre. Um, I don't know what he called him, but uh, at any rate, um, he says we're we're going on on with this. And in fact, you know, Borgard's main uh, contention was that they will be entrenched and they know we're coming. Those were his two main points. Mm-hmm. Uh, neither of which proved to be the case. Johnson was right. Johnson was was correct in in that part of uh, of uh, continuing the attack. Yeah. Hey, we have a question from another fine. Civil War biographer of Shiloh, Gail Stevens is with Hi, us. Hi, Gail. Yeah, hello, Gail. And Gail wants to know: Was Johnston's Shiloh battle plan a gamble? Uh, the whole thing, yes, was was a gamble. Um, his battle plan is not really his battle plan, and I assume, Gail, you're talking about the the columns of corps, uh, which is really more more Beauregard's idea. Um, and in fact, Beauregard's the way the corps are aligned and, and all of that will naturally turn the Union right flank toward Pittsburgh Landing. Johnston's idea, of course, is to turn the Union left flank away from Pittsburgh Landing. Um, and so you, and this is part of the just mind numbing part that I wish like everything we had Johnston's report or we wish uh, we had something from Johnson. He, he doesn't leave us you know, anything because he dies on the field. Um, but the decision-making process about uh, how we get from Bo- from Johnston's original plan that he tells Jefferson Davis we're going to hook around the left and, and you know, do a linear formation um, to how we get to Beauregard's, we, we don't really know how that actually happened. Uh, we know we wound up with Beauregard's plan, which is adverse to, to Johnston's plan. Uh, but then Johnson has to kind of clean it up. He issues that order on the march up there that says, OK, you know, in this way that we're we're deployed, um, we're still going to try to hook around the Union left flank and drive them into the into the creeks and, and all of that. So um, Johnston's plan is is firm in his mind. It doesn't get executed. And, you know, that's largely on him as the army army commander he does make attempts to kind of clean it up you know after there's the the confusion and all that but the larger plan in and of itself just absolutely is is um not feasible in terms of the lay of the land uh, and i've always said the terrain is the key factor at, at shallow um if you uh, well i talk about this in the the conqueror parish book um the Johnston knew the the larger parameters of the battlefield, but he doesn't know the interior creeks and the the secondary creeks and ravines and all that, which play a much greater role than this larger parameter creeks that Johnston talks about. They can present no greater front between these two creeks right. than we can, and and all of that. So, um, really, the plan is is not feasible given the terrain. Um, but then Beauregard's is not either. Um, so it, it's a gamble. Uh, certainly they don't know um, the, the stakes they're playing with uh, or not, not really the stakes they're playing with. They don't know maybe the game they're playing with or the table or who they're playing with kind of thing. Um, it's, a, it's a vast unknown that doesn't serve them well at all. Right, right. Good to hear from you, Gail. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Gail. And then that uh, you know that does bring us to the battlefield i guess see we uh so once he's on the battlefield again he continues making uh taking chances uh making uh making various gambles he decides to leave beauregard in the rear to manage the battle normally the job of the commanding general and he goes to the front to presumably uh inspire the troops yeah uh what do you think, you know, how does that work out for him? Well, this is the critical one, obviously. And this is where I talk about Johnston goes past the Nimitz calculated risk t- kind of thing to the all in. I'm going to wager everything I've got in a couple of IOUs, too. You know, 
um, on the the one final hand that I think I've got a winning hand here. I'm gonna bet it bet the the house on it. Um, and that, of course, is within the context of the fighting, not getting into the tactical action. But if this is Johnson's critical gamble in the West, um, the whole idea of turning that Union left flank just is not working. And so Johnson sees the need to go to the front and make that work. And so he is on the Confederate right trying to turn that, that Union left um, and finally decides he has to lead it himself. And uh, that's, of course, when he takes a mini ball or whatever kind of ball to the to the knee, um, severs the artery and he bleeds to death there at 230 uh, in that that ravine there at Shiloh. So it's the it's the critical moment of Johnston's critical gamble um, that really is the only time that southern armies will have parity really with with Union armies in in the West, uh, certainly with a chance to. To, to revoke or, or undo a lot of the Union successes that, that's come along. And that doesn't even mention Johnson personally. And Johnson, mm -hmm. I am convinced, he's a noble, honorable man that um, has the Confederacy at heart. Uh, but there is no human being on earth that could separate, you know, what you want good for the Confederacy with what you know, you also want good for yourself. And he realizes he's under a cloud. He realizes he's the persona non grata in the, in the Confederacy where just months ago he was the savior of the South type thing. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there's definitely a, a component of, you know, I need to, to revive my reputation as well. And a victory, he tells people, you know, all I need is a victory and I'll be praised. You know, uh, all of the complaints will stop. So um, there's, there's definitely a part of that um personally but i am absolutely convinced that he's got the confederacy at large um, much higher up than than him personally and that actually is another one of those traits that we've seen in his life prior you know um where he would give of himself or not retaliate when um you know somebody does him wrong or or something so uh we see a lot of the the traits there but this is the final gamble um much like the duel in in texas uh and this time it cost him his life yeah hey i want to take one step back before we move on to our second book uh because yeah there's a moment and it's a moment in your book but it's also i've had the good fortune to uh walk that part of the shiloh battlefield with you and uh, be on one of your programs and uh, there's an episode that happens it's outside of what is now the shiloh battlefield park uh, up on the locust above the locust grove branch uh where he's talking with a staff member thomas munford i guess and and explains how this this last attack he's putting in the reserves uh over there to attack the union right and as they disappear below down into the ravine he turns to munford he says that checkmates them that checkmates them and again he's playing chess uh, and yeah, exactly. and munford replies you're a better player than I am. I'll have to trust you on that. I, I mean, just don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just don't see it. So, yeah. So what's your take on that? I mean, there he is with somebody politely trying to tell him, I don't see it even at that last minute. Right. He, he thinks he has the union left turned at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and he just doesn't. And that feeds into a little bit of the historiography. You mentioned historiography a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Um, the the common conception certainly by Johnston's son and by a lot of lost causers later on mm -hmm. uh, is that Johnston died winning the battle uh, that Beauregard actually threw away Johnston's victory uh, and had Johnston lived uh, they would have pushed on to 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 victory um, I'm of the opinion that Johnston is fighting a losing battle at this point he spun his wheels way too much there's probably no hope at this point of winning the battle um, and so he's conducting a, a losing battle and this, you know, this whole thing I was doing an interview just the other day and I was talking about, um, you know, there are some that will say, oh, well, no, you've got it all wrong. And I don't presume to be the, the best or the, or the brightest or the, the most knowledgeable or have all the right answers or, or whatever. Um, I'm telling what I think, but yeah. I don't presume to be, you know, the, others can have their opinions, but. What I did say is if if you're the of the idea that Johnston could have taken Grant's last line of defense after, you know, 13 hours of fighting across that terrain, Dill Branch Ravine and all that, um, 
if you haven't been to Shiloh, go to Shiloh and tramp around in those ravines mm -hmm. a little bit, and then we'll talk. You know, we need to be on the same page while we're talking about this stuff. So um, if you if you been through those ravines and seen Grant's last line and all of that and still think Johnston um, could have taken that last line of defense, then, you know, we can discuss it and, and yeah. just agree to disagree kind of thing. But um, but until you see all that, um, I don't think there's there's any say any need yeah. to argue. It's dramatic terrain, to say the yeah. least. And he didn't know that. That was one of the many things he didn't know before okay. making his his uh, final gamble. Hey, let's uh, let's wrap up this part of the conversation. But I want to let everyone know it is the Iron Dice of Battle, Albert Sidney Johnston and the Civil War in the West. Uh, it is from Louisiana State University Press. Uh, first, we're selling first editions with a custom signed book plate. Uh, Abraham Lincoln Bookshop book plate signed by uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, there are 222 pages, maps and illustrations, $39.95. You can order it at the link, uh, which brings us to the second book in our discussion today, because you just can't seem to stop writing. Uh, <laughs> it's just whenever you get an idea, you just seem to, well, you've got all, you've got a good library there to write from. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the second book for today is the fourth, right? The fourth in a series of books about uh, the Vicksburg campaign, Bayou yeah. Battles for Vicksburg, the Swamp and River Expeditions, January 1st through April 30th, 1863. It is from University Press of Kansas. Uh, again, we're selling first edition copies, signed. It's 526 pages, illustrations, maps. The cost is $49.95. We'll put a link in the comments where you can... Uh, where you can order it and Tim five volumes about Vicksburg and you have arrived at my favorite volume. Oh, really? Good. Yeah. All of my favorite stories about Vicksburg are in this volume because any story that involves a great big hole in the ground filled <laughs> with mud and water and people getting stuck and being miserable in the rain. To me, that is civil war <laughs> history, <laughs> almost more than the battles. Um, right. Right. And I do think, I do think this is a decisive chapter in the Vicksburg campaign. Um, so, but, but before you go to the book, can you give us, give us an elevator pitch? I mean, 30 seconds, the elevator ride on why a five volume classic military history of the Vicksburg campaign. Well, it, the campaign lasted uh, what seven, eight, nine months. Um, so it's a it's a lengthy thing. Uh, there's a lot of action, a lot of things going on. So it, it takes that to to um, to to cover it in the in the detail that I wanted to. And it, there's really not a lot of detail in terms of the battles. This is an operational level um, study, uh, looking more at the campaign than any individual battles. Now, I did go into tactical action a lot with the assaults, but um, really, you know, it's the same old thing with Professor Rowland. Uh, the, we've had some one volume studies of Vicksburg, uh, but one volume, you can't produce a one volume study big enough to uh, probably um, build on anything that Ed Barst did, you know, in, mm -hmm. in his massive three volumes. Uh, you can take different angles, you know, with, with social history or political history and, and things like that. Um, but again, you know, with, with Boris being the, the standard treatment out there, um, that was done 50, 60, whatever, 70 years ago as well. Um, mm -hmm. Published in the 1980s, I think it was written in the 1960s. But, um, you know, again, not trying to replace, trying to, to build on, but I think after 50, 60 years, it's time for another uh, similarly level in-depth study uh, of something that's this magnificent and this important in the Civil War. Yeah, now it's the, I said it's the fourth of five volumes. In the chronology of the campaign, it is number two. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it I, is the, it is, yeah. yeah. Um, I, but in this book, one thing I like about this book, as soon as I crack it open, is in Bayou Battles, you bring a sort of analytical framework to the book that you're going to come back to time and time again, every time that Grant, in this case, Grant is kind of seen as the protagonist, although you do 
cover Johnston and Pemberton and all the rest. But there's this analytical framework that's facing Grant where uh, you sort of compare what he's doing uh, in, in, in the long term to the writings of uh, Carl von Clausewitz or Henri Jomini. Is it Henri? Henri? Uh, but Henri. Jomini and Clausewitz. Or you tend to use the terms by the book and not by the book but you bring this back again and again each one of grant's each one of grant's attempts and there are many attempts to capture vicksburg in this book are sort of compared against okay how was this by the book or not by the book and how did that help it help the plan succeed or not am i right about that Yes, definitely. And when I say by the book, I mean mostly Jomini's book because that's the only one that was known. Clausewitz was mm. relatively unknown, uh, not even printed in English until 19, or 1873. Mm. Um, how much Grant knew about Jomini, he admits, you know, I never read him very, very much. So uh, the, the thing about by the book is also kind of a nod to Henry Halleck. Uh, Grant would have been much more familiar with Henry Halleck's work uh, the, I believe it's the elements of military art and science. Mm-hmm. Halleck would be the American Jomini at this point, the American thinker, although it's mostly just translated and plagiarized. But um, that that would have been Therefore, the it's Jomini. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but you know, Halleck being Grant's boss, you see right off the bat, Grant wanted to please the boss. You know, you get a big promotion, um, and the the boss man has promoted you. You're going to try to do things his way in the way he wants you to do it, right? Um, but it just doesn't work in this particular environment. And Grant finds that out in the Mississippi Central Campaign, uh, the Chickasaw Bio uh, Operations, which is volume one of this study. And so what we see Grant is in volume two here in these bio operations, he's he's really um, going against the grain. You can call it against the grain, you can call it against the book. Uh, sometimes I talk about thinking outside of the box. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to 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 use metaphors for this mm-hmm. uh but grant realizes that this stuff is not going to work the way um the theorists write it up and so i gotta figure out my own way to do this and so i uh, you know I, uh, not humorously but somewhat humorously talk about um there's not a lot about changing entire rivers continental rivers courses you know in Germany. there's right. not a lot about flooding vast lowlands you know to to out flood the enemy kind of thing uh, so there are numerous uh, examples like that that are not in Germany or Clausewitz, um, but are are new, you know, new thinking uh, in terms of the way Grant does something. Uh, in particular, the biggest one, of course, is the last attempt to get to the high ground east of Vicksburg, and that is going south of Vicksburg, crossing the river at Bruinsburg and, and reaching the high ground there. Uh, that is completely uh, going against the whole um, safe supply line thing of uh, Germany is very much and Halleck to that to that degree as well. Um, they emphasize, you know, uh, safe supply lines, secure supply lines, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Grant's movement south of Vicksburg is anything, but he's basically putting the enemy between him and his base of supplies. Uh, and that's an absolute no-no if you're going by the book. Mm-hmm. Now the uh, the the there are battles covered in Bayou Battles. It starts with the uh, battle at Arkansas Post, Arkansas uh, but I'm going to let people buy the book and read about that, largely because it's not Grant's, and I don't think Grant entirely approved of the expedition to Arkansas Post. Well, not until he realized that his buddy Sherman was behind it, and then oh, right. it was okay all of a sudden. So. <laughs> so it was a great idea since it was Sherman's. I hated it when it was McClernand's, uh, but yeah, but it, Grant's first. A project of his own is this attempt to change the river. Now that fascinates me. I, yeah. Anything that involves water going downhill fascinates me. It's just <laughs> something about my brain. But right. the uh, I love this story of the of of Grant's canal uh, or <laughs> Butler's ditch. That's why we put Butler on the uh, on the right yeah. <laughs> on the set today. Um, yeah, how do you know? Just briefly give us this. Um, uh, a rundown on how Grant has this idea, well, if I can't get to the enemy and beat him, let's change the map. Right. Well, it's it's not totally Grant's idea. And okay. so, um, you know, it had been, the idea had started back in 1862 
with Thomas Williams um, and Admiral Farragut, David Farragut, mm -hmm. uh, as they arrive in front of Vicksburg in uh, May and June and July of 1862. Um, it had been a small scale effort uh, and hadn't really, really gone anywhere. When Grant returns in January of 1863, uh, they restart the process uh, because they think, hey, this this might actually work. Uh, but also at the same time, they've got Lincoln on their on um, on their back saying, hey, try this canal. Lincoln thinks it's going to work. And mm -hmm. what's interesting, Lincoln had actually uh, floated down the Mississippi River twice back sure. in 18, I think, 1820s and 1830s. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Lincoln knew about it, the, you know, the river's. Um, propensity to, to change course and to leave these oxbow lakes and all that. And Lincoln and Washington sitting there thinking, you know, if we can just do this, we'll leave Vicksburg high and dry. So why not try the canal? Um, of course, it doesn't work, um, but it's a, it's an attempt. Uh, there's no real, um, and you see this with all of these attempts, except the last one, uh, crossing the river at Bruinsburg. Uh, these are what I kind of describe as, as low risk, high reward operations if if mm -hmm. uh, they fail nobody's really gonna get hurt it's not going to endanger the army at most maybe a couple of brigades or division or something is is involved uh, so it's not it's not high risk in terms of the entire army uh, but if one of them should succeed man this will be a game changer in terms of Vicksburg none of them do uh, of course the last one which I'm sure we'll get to is is uh, high risk high reward uh, and yeah fortunately for granted it works yeah yeah and so that yeah like after so after the canal he moves from uh civil engineering projects to as uh, i think I, I think you as you described it if i heard you right trying to flood the enemy out or use you know flood the ground so that now he can move his troops uh through the flooded areas so he can get to the high ground but still be on the north side of the of the uh of vicksburg who we have right. tell us about like yazoo pass and yeah the well i use there there are a couple different on, on each side of the river two different really philosophies here uh the canal itself is i don't think it's intended to be the the end all be all uh you know war ending move mm -hmm. uh, what it's intended to do is to get union vessels particularly gunboats south of Vicksburg without having to run the major batteries at Vicksburg, mm -hmm. which they find out later on can be done. But at this point, they're just deathly afraid of, of doing that. Um, and so you want to get gunboats south of Vicksburg to interdict the, the travel uh, of Confederate steamers between Vicksburg and Port Hudson. Um, commissary coming out of uh, the Red River, uh, mm -hmm. all of that. Um, and so the canal, Lake Providence as well, that whole thing where they flood Lake Providence and connect with all those different bios and rivers over in Louisiana, uh, that's an attempt to do the same thing. Um, you still got at some point probably tangle with, with Vicksburg. Uh, and that's where the two on the east side of the Mississippi River uh, come in uh, at Yazoo Pass. They try to flood the Delta um, and move through Moon Lake and Yazoo Pass to the Coldwater, to the Tallahatchie, to the Yazoo. Uh, trying to get to that high ground um, east of, of Vicksburg and basically outflank uh, the Yazoo River defenses. Uh, just up river from the mouth of the Yazoo is Snyder's Bluff, Haynes Bluff, um, and the Confederates have guns there blocking that river. So to get on that high ground, and there's you know defenses between Snyder's Bluff and Vicksburg, that's what Sherman found at Chickasaw Bayou, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, to get to that high ground, you, you've got to go either past Vicksburg's guns or Snyder's Bluffs guns are through the fortifications in between and Sherman proved that couldn't be done in December so so how do you do it well what both Yazoo Pass and Steele's bio expeditions are are attempts to plant Union forces in rear of Snyder's Bluff and Haynes Bluff and Vicksburg on that high ridge um, and and the idea is not you don't have to plant the whole army you don't have to move the whole army through um, Moon Lake and Yazoo Pass, for instance, but now Grant later on is starting to think, okay, we'll send four or five, six divisions through there. You just need enough to outflank Snyder's Bluff so that the Confederates will withdraw from that so that then you can move Union transports up the Yazoo to land without being um, without being blown out of the water. Uh, so it's, all, it's maneuver, it's flanking, um, trying to get around, get to that high ground, all of that kind of stuff. 
um, and they're absolutely fascinating uh, expeditions, just, you know, just fascinating as, as right. they can be. Um, but again, they are fairly low risk um, and high reward if they work, but neither one of them do. Um, they, they, as they go on, they get a little more risky. Um, only a couple of divisions go into the Azu Pass expedition. Uh, in the in the Steels Bio Expedition, Porter Admiral Porter comes dang near losing his entire flotilla, right. uh, mm -hmm. all those gunboats. Which that in and of itself, how they got in and got out and all that is is fascinating. But um, they're they're still low risk, high reward. Um, and this, it, you know, just to add a little bit, Grant. You, you know, I'm not one of these that Grant's stupid and Grant's bad and a liar and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do have to watch Grant's memoirs a little bit. He'll say some things in his memoirs that don't really jive with what he was saying at the time. And so Grant says in his memoirs, I never really thought any of these work. We're just buying our time. We're keeping busy, busy work kind of stuff. Uh, but if you look at his letters at, at the time, he is putting a lot of stock in the Yazoo Pass and Steel's Bio and the Canal and, mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, thinking maybe this is the time, maybe this is the one that's going to work, um, and alas, none do. Right, and you're uh, you're absolutely right that these episodes, which I think they get bypassed by people when they think about the history of the campaign, they don't seem to have battles or what people want from right. a battle. But these are some of the most fascinating stories yeah. in the in in, in any campaign there's so much more cooperation or coordination between union navy and union yeah, uh, cool. army working together army soldiers working in the role of marines so as close as you have marine work in the civil war this is some of it and then the counter tactics from the confederates uh yeah. are fascinating in these particular uh, operations give us give us a little bit of confederate point of view in turning back those bayou operations well they will uh they will utilize everything that they can including kind of like you know later red river operations in 1864 they will flood areas themselves to try to block them off they will tamper with the the original geography uh to block off this stream so it'll flood into this one and all of that kind of stuff uh they will mount cannons on on um steamers to make cotton clads you know defend them with cotton and and all that the key here is though that that the confederates have interior lines of communication where they can shift troops in a smaller area uh to where they need to go um faster than grant can do it on a larger arc you know uh in in exterior lines of communication so um pemberton does a pretty good job of parrying each of these threats uh, and it's mainly because um, they're they're on a just huge chessboard. To go back to Albert Sidney Johnson a little bit, Grant and Prem Pemberton are playing this out on just a huge chessboard. Uh, and so Grant's moves are slow, and it takes a while to develop over hundreds of miles. You know, um, so Pemberton has time to think and to react. Uh, what's fascinating is that as these operations get cl get closer into Vicksburg and get faster. Uh, Pemberton's reaction time is lessened, and as a result, the indecisive Pemberton has a much more difficult time parrying each of the threats. He just barely gets troops in, in front of, uh, of Steele's bio, uh, and Porter in the Steele's bio operation. It's a pretty close run thing, uh, but, he, but he does. Um, what we'll see in the last attempt, of course, when Grant finally lands 30 miles south of Vicksburg, that that's just way too close in. It happens too fast. And Pemberton's not able to to react in time. And then as Grant marches inland, uh, Grant's almost marching circles around Pemberton, and Pemberton right. is his his head's just spinning on his shoulders almost. Now, when April comes around, uh, and and Grant finally moves into this final high risk, high reward plan, the one that works, um, do do you find that he thinks, okay, now we're really going to this one's going to work, or now we're getting serious? Or has he already been thinking, oh, well, these should have worked and let's try this one new? Yeah, yes, he's definitely thinking they should have worked. Um, but he's to the point, this is what's significant, he's to the point that he is out of operation. He, he's out of options. Uh, there yeah. is no, um, you know, you, you cross the River Brunsburg and march off into Mississippi without a line of supply and away from the gunboats, all that kind of stuff. 
um, I jokingly say if this is plan, uh, this is the seventh attempt. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, <laughs> if, if this is plan G, uh, there is no plan what comes after G A B C D E F G H H. There is yes. no plan H. Um, you you can't you know there this is this is Grant's do or die moment. This is Grant's right. conquer or perish moment, like like Johnston before, mm -hmm. and it is an absolute gamble. Um, but Grant even you know I've often said that Grant's major, uh, and I'm a Grant fan, but I don't mind calling him out when it, in certain ways. Um, if Grant has a major fault, it's not his drinking, it's not, you know, butcher and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, if Grant has a major problem, it's overconfidence. And you see that time and again at Belmont, he thinks he's going to run the table and he gets whacked over the head. Um, at Fort Donaldson, he thinks nothing's going to happen in the Confederates counterattack. At Shallow, he thinks nothing's going to happen mm -hmm. and he gets into the largest battle in American history to that point. Uh, earlier stages of the Vicksburg campaign. He's writing Julia all the time. I think we're going to be in Vicksburg in a fortnight. This is like January and April, February, February, you know. Um, and the, the overconfidence here, Grant actually writes Julia several times and other people. And he says, you know, the hard part is going to be getting across the river. That's going to be tough. Grand Gulf landing the army and, and all that kind of stuff. And he says more than one time, more than two or three times, once across the river, I think it's going to be an easy thing. Then it's it's going to be it's the the work's more than half done. It's it's going to be an easy easy thing. Then uh, oh, did he have a lot to learn? It was not right. that, that easy. Uh, which, by the way, is the the uh, subject of the of the next volume of the next one. Yeah. Hey, let's yeah, get to that. <laughs> let's get to that in just a second. But I want to make sure I do a shout out because. Uh, like I said, we're on a tight schedule this time, and I want to make sure I get a shout out to some of our friends that are watching. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we do have uh, um, uh, Hampton Newsom, also a fine historian, is oh. watching, says hello. Dave Kansas Brad published. yes. What's that? Kansas, uh, Hampton, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Dave Bradley from the UK is watching. Hey, Carlos. Dave. Yo, you know Dave, huh? Yeah, I saw him back uh, this summer in London, yeah. Oh, great. Carlos Rivera. Uh, the folks at Civil War Breakfast Club, the podcast, oh, yeah. are yeah. watching, and they're saying here that's uh, Darren and Mayor, yes. Ted Quill. Darren is here, um, and then from the Civil War Breakfast Club account, let's say this is from uh, Darren and Mary. Tim, what part of the Vicksburg campaign do you think gets overlooked and deserves more study? Um, well, certainly these bio operations do. Mm -hmm. um, they just kind of. Uh, get all all dumped into into one kind of you know chapter or something. Mm -hmm. um, I think ironically the siege gets gets um, uh, de-emphasized maybe a little bit, um, and and I think that's because it was so long and so many you know just same thing over and over and over. Um, but it's ironic because there's a, that's what the national park deals with. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the Vicksburg campaign is a multifaceted thing. Uh, but what the national park actually interprets and, and deals with, uh, on the ground there are the assaults and, and the siege. Um, so I think that gets a little, uh, a little overlooked. That's why I wrote an 800 page book on the siege, I guess. But, uh, uh, at any rate, I'm, I'm trying to bring some of these underemphasized, um, uh, Topics to like certainly the Mississippi Central campaign um, does sure. and people so vile. So. Yeah, that that didn't have a book at all until the one that you right. wrote, and then Bill Shepard from who's uh, uh, from here around Chicago wants to know. Uh, well, first he says Mr. Smith is an extraordinary productive author. He wants to sort of pull the. I think Bill wants to pull the uh, uh, the curtain back on the details of writing. Uh, can you describe your way of researching, organizing, and writing so many great books on Vicksburg in a relatively short period of time? Um, well, every book and every project is different. Um, uh, for instance, I normally, when I'm writing about battles or something, I'll start with just the official records and the reports. That's the best group grouping of information that, that we've got. Um, and I'll basically write the chapters uh, from from that. Uh, then I'll go back into the manuscript material and I'll go through just tons of manuscript material, adding in uh, detail or quotes or, or whatever. And then I'll start gradually moving out to the less 
what I deem as less important or less uh, believable material like uh, maybe post-war uh, memoirs or uh, things like that. And then the least of all, the secondary literature. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't read anything of the secondary literature, for instance, Ed Barst, as much as I respect Ed and, and his, his volumes and all that. Um, and I did, you know, with Shallow or whatever I'm working on, I don't read the secondary literature till the last thing, because number one, I don't want it to influence the way I'm thinking or the way I'm presenting it, um, because I want the sources to lead me. I want the, the primary uh, there on the ground sources to, to lead me in the story that I'm telling. Um, and so I, I wait till the end for the for the secondary sources. And so what I mainly read them for is to basically just make sure I didn't miss anything. You know, I read through Ed's accounts uh, to make sure I didn't there wasn't a major story or major point of emphasis that I just completely um, forgot or uh, or sources that I missed or or something like that. So that's what I'll use the the secondary. Uh, information for but but primarily i'll start with the with the on the ground contemporary stuff and work my way out from that all right um and this does bring us we're very near the end of our time so uh tim what is the next book which is the third volume of five well it's the inland campaign for vicksburg it's already uh on kansas's site and amazon and all that um and it's another whatever five 150 page book um, dealing with May the 1st through the 17th. Once once Grant gets across the river, he gets across the river at the tail end of this volume that we're talking about today um, and basically is has a toehold. Uh, so the seventh attempt, and I, that's one of the things I wanted to keep the attempts together. And once that succeeds and on the seventh attempt or plan G or whatever it is, um, then I wanted to look at, at his inland campaign. And so those five battles in 17 days uh, will be covered and they're not major tactical studies. Of course, I've done tactical stuff on, um, on Champion Hill uh, and, and Gerson's Raid, for instance, and all of that. Uh, so it's not, not detailed tactical stuff, it's operational level, uh, but there's a fascinating amount of stuff in between the battles. The battles are fascinating, I deal with those. Uh, but the, the main, focus, I guess, emphasis for this volume is mainly logistics on both sides. And this whole thing about Grant cutting away from his supply line and the wagon trains and the foraging and all that, I spend a lot of time uh, trying to hopefully nail down just what all happened, because that's a big question mark in a lot of people's minds. So, All right. Well, so we've done. Let, me, let me show you something here, folks. In time, we're going to fill that hole and then of what you see there. (laughs) And this is going to be the Tim Smith Vicksburg bookshelf. And I'm sure there's others that could or should be there as well. Um, But yeah, like you said, you've done this uh, tactical study on Champion Hill. You've done leadership analysis on Grant. The decision was always my own. Grusin, the real, real horse soldiers. And then five volumes on Vicksburg with a little hole there where Lincoln is holding the place open until... April, when your next volume comes out, this is what you're going to eventually need, I think, folks, if you want to get a fulsome, multi, uh, a fulsome look of the campaign from various directions. Like Tim says, these five volumes are operational histories, but you also have an example of a tactical battle study and uh, the and the raid, and then the analytical thing from the decision was always my own. Um, and so in my opinion, this is what you're going to eventually need, but this is what we're looking at today. Um, so, uh, the two battle, the two books we're looking at today that you can order, if you follow the links there, the Iron Dice of Battle, Albert Sidney Johnston and the Civil War in the West, um, 39.95, it's from LSU Press, and then Bayou Battles for Vicksburg, the Swamp and River Operations, January 1 to April 30th, 1863, 526 pages, a short volume compared to the siege book, (laughs) and, uh, uh, but $49.95, and it's volume two of five, and again, Tim, thank you so much for joining us today for 
a house divided. Is there anything you want to share with us before we wrap it up? No, I just appreciate what you do and uh, hello to all the folks out there. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, one last thing before I go. This is the end of the 2023 season for A House Divided. So my thanks to everybody who has watched these interviews in 2023. My thanks to everybody who has ordered, signed first edition books. That's why we do this. That's why we have A House Divided. We want you to build your own fine library of signed first edition books, your own collection of fine first edition books. And we curate those for you and we bring you the authors so that you can meet them here on A House Divided. Coming up next year, I don't have your dates right now, but I want to give you a little teaser. Keep an eye out for our emails and for our social media to tell you when and where. You're going to see uh, books by such fine authors as James H. Reed, Harold Holzer, Doris Kearns Goodwin, and once again, I'm sure Timothy B. Smith will come back so that we can discuss those five battles. Uh, so thanks again to everybody who came, who's watching today. And uh, thanks again to you, Tim. And we'll see everybody again next time, next year on A House Divided.